It's the first Sunday of December and let me give a warm welcome to you as you join our People's Church service today. Welcome also to the Christmas season. And even as we come together to worship God, I want to encourage you to join our worship team in singing these songs of praise and join us in our times of prayer and give heed to the word of God that will come to you today. Thank you so much for joining us and I know that the Lord has something very special that he wants to do for you today and a way he wants to speak to you as well. So let's pray and commit this service to the Lord in prayer and I know that as we go through this service you are going to be encouraged. Let us pray. Father in the name of Jesus we thank you for the Christmas season for we know that it re reminds us of the coming of the Messiah, the Son of the living God to take away the sins of the world. Thank you, Lord, that you are with us today as we go into this service. And I pray that everything we do will be for your praise, your glory and your honor. Lord, I pray that through this service, everyone who joins us will receive a very specific and a special touch from you because you care for them, you are concerned about them, O oh God. Bless this service with the anointing of your Holy Spirit, I pray, in the matchless name of Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord and Savior. Amen. Amen. Joy to the world, the Lord has come. Let earth receive her King. Let every heart prepare Him room. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and nature sing. And heaven and heaven and nature sing. Enjoy, repeat the sound, enjoy, repeat, repeat. 
Hallelujah. We praise you, O oh God. We praise you for your wonderful presence, the glory of your presence, which is so real to those who put their trust in you, O oh God. We thank you because your presence goes with us, goes beside us, and walks with us, Lord, through all the challenges of life. We praise you, we exalt you, and glorify you for your wonderful presence in our lives, O oh God. Hallelujah. Praise be unto you, Lord. Friends, it's been such a beautiful time that we could join our worship team and sing these songs of praise and worship unto the Lord. And I pray that with every song, your heart has risen up in encouragement and hope for what God can do for you today. In a short while, we will be hearing the message for today and I believe that God is a very specific word, a word that will speak to your heart and challenge you today. But before that, I want to take a moment to pray for you. I want to pray for all of you who are battling different challenges in your life and I want to pray for our nation as well. Would you bow, bow your hearts with me in prayer as we commit uh, our nation and commit your needs to the Lord in prayer? Shall we pray? O oh Lord, our Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have said that we can call upon you in the day of trouble and that you will answer, O oh God. Lord, today, many people, many of those who are watching this service, O oh God, are battling challenges to which sometimes they don't have answers, Lord. Lord, they need wisdom, they need direction, they need miracles, they need healing. And therefore, Lord, in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, the name by which we can experience all that we require, O oh God, in that name, I pray healing, O oh God, for those who need healing. May the healing power of God just touch them as we pray right now, Lord. For those who are battling challenges to their family or in their workplace, Lord, I pray for the supernatural hand of God to minister and to help them through those challenges, my God. Lord, for those who are in need, that you will open up your resources, O oh God, and provide for them in supernatural ways, my God. Lord, heal people of emotional disturbances, of depression, O oh God, and other challenges, Father. And today, as they lift up their need to you, as they lift up their problems to you, in the name of Jesus, I pray for a supernatural intervention, Lord, that you can bring about in their lives, in their families, O oh God. Hallelujah. Father, I lift up our nation to you at this time, Lord with all the challenges that this nation is going through. I pray that you would bring, Lord, your grace, your blessing, and your favor to bear upon this nation, my God. Lord, I pray that you would make this nation to move forward in the right direction, my Lord. I pray for guidance for all the decision makers of our land, my God, for those in governmental authority, other places of authority, that you would lead them, guide them, show them, Lord, how to make the right decisions, Lord. Help them to make the right decisions. Lord, give them, Lord, the, the grace they need, my God, the wisdom they need, Lord, to, to bring about changes, Lord, that will bless this land and make this land more productive, O oh God. Lord, make this land to prosper, O oh God. And right now, I also pray about the COVID situation, Lord, with this new variant that they are talking about. Lord, I pray your protection over our borders, the borders of Sri Lanka, Lord, from this uh, variant, this new variant, my Lord. You will protect our people. You will help the health authorities, my Lord, to make the right decisions, Lord, to, to curtail this from becoming a problem in our land, my God. And we pray, Lord, that COVID will come to an end in this nation, my Lord. And Lord, we pray that people also would act responsibly, give us the wisdom to act responsibly, Lord, wherever we go, Lord, whatever we do, my God. Lord, I also pray for the dengue situation, Lord, that you will intervene and may this also be brought under control, Lord, as, as you give the grace that is required, the help that is required to all the authorities who are handling this, my Lord. I pray your blessing upon this beautiful island of Sri Lanka, Lord, and help us to see the glory of God in this land, I pray. In Jesus' name I ask this. Amen. Amen. Thank you, friends, for joining us in prayer today. And I know that as we've cried out to the Lord, that the Lord will answer because He is more than able to answer the cry of our heart, not just for our needs, but for our nation as well. At this time, let's open our hearts to receive God's word. And I know that God is a very specific and a special word for you. So let me invite Pastor Dishan Vikramaratna to come and share the message with us that God has laid upon his heart. May it bless you. I'd like to welcome you to today's service. My name is Dishan. I'm one of the pastors at the People's Church. And it's my privilege to share God's word with you today. I think about December, we're just getting into the Christmas season, and this is a time when many people who follow Jesus, many Christians, celebrate. But this year, I wonder, should we really be celebrating anything? After all, 
It's been a very difficult year. So many of us have lost our jobs or found it extremely difficult financially. Uh, we are struggling to pay the bills. People we love, people we care about have gotten sick. Many people have died. We are a nation, maybe even a world, in real anguish and distress. Should we really be celebrating Christmas at a time like this? And even if we do celebrate Christmas, what exactly should we be celebrating? I mean, everybody, everybody celebrates Christmas. There are so many people who do not even believe in Jesus, who still do the shopping sprees and the dinners and the big parties at Christmas time. They celebrate Christmas. But us as Christ followers, as people who follow Jesus, what exactly about Christmas should we be celebrating? I want to just put this thought in front of you that the reason we celebrate Christmas is not because of the story of, you know, the, the manger and the little baby in the manger and the three wise men and the star in the sky and the shepherds and all of that. That's not the reason we celebrate Christmas. Actually, there isn't really any point in celebrating the birth of Jesus unless we also know and appreciate what he did with his life. As Christians, as followers of Christ, we celebrate his birth because we know now what he ended up doing with his life. I would go as far as to say that if we don't actually know and appreciate and, and accept what he did with his life, there really is no point in celebrating his birth. So why do we celebrate Jesus' life? That is the question I want to answer today. I mean, there are so many of us, we, we thank, are thankful for Jesus, we worship Jesus, we love Jesus, we obey Jesus. But why is he worthy of celebration? I want to turn today to a passage of scripture that isn't often shared in December. It's an unusual passage of scripture to share at this part of the year, but I want to be faithful and obedient to God's word and share it with you today. And I'm going to be in two, actually two passages of scripture. They're very closely linked to each other. The first one is Luke chapter 22, and the second one is 1 Corinthians 11. Two chapters. And so if you are watching today and you have a, a paper Bible with you, you can put one a finger on Luke 22 and one finger on 1 Corinthians 11. And this is what the Word of God says. Luke chapter 22, starting from verse 7. I'm reading from the English Standard Version. Luke 22, verse 7. Then came the day of unleavened bread, on which the Passover lamb had to be sacrificed. You know, this passage was written, this book was written in a first century Jewish context, basically meaning that it was written a couple of thousand years ago in a different part of the world. And sometimes things that were very, very obvious to the, the original listeners might not be that obvious today. This passage talks about the Passover meal, the meal of the festival of unleavened bread. What was this Passover meal? If this is a strange term to you, do not worry. I'm fully aware that there are many people from many different backgrounds and many, at many stages of their faith journey watching us. So if this is new to you, I'm going to catch you up really quickly. And I'm going to give you about 2,000 years of, of Jewish history in about a minute and a half. So bear with me, but I want all of us to go together through this story. And right now, where we are, the start of our story is not actually here. The start of our story is actually a, a few thousand years before this meal that Jesus is just about to have with his disciples. At the, at the start of our story, the people of Israel are in Egypt, slaves in the land of Egypt. And to cut a very long story short, uh, God sends his man, Moses, to the land of Egypt to tell Pharaoh, the, the head of the land of Egypt, so to speak, to let his people go. Pharaoh refuses and God sends plagues, different obstacles and challenges to the land of Egypt to convince Pharaoh to change his mind. But Pharaoh will not change his mind. And so finally, God says, Pharaoh, if you do not let my people go, if you do not free my people, I am going to kill every firstborn son in the land of Egypt. Pharaoh refuses to change his mind. And God says, I will send the angel of death over the land of Egypt and every firstborn son, every elder son in every family is going to die. He tells the people of Israel, this is the fate I have for the land of Egypt. If you do not want the firstborn sons in your families to die, you need to kill a lamb and put its blood on your doorposts so that when the angel of death passes over, passes over your homes, your sons will be spared. On that fateful night, the people of Israel gathered together. They, they killed the lamb. They sacrificed the lamb. They took the blood and put it over their doorposts. The angel of death passed over that nation and every firstborn son in that nation perished except for in the homes where the blood of the lamb had been put on the doorpost. 
that angel of death passed over the people of Israel. He passed over the people of Israel. The people of Israel did not have to suffer the consequences of their sin. They did not have to be in captivity anymore because God's anger and judgment had passed over them. And for every year after that, annually, the people of Israel, the Jewish people, celebrate Passover now, celebrating this freedom from slavery that they now enjoy. This was the Passover meal that Jesus was just about to take part in with his disciples. But this particular meal would be different to any other meal in the history of that nation. Over the years, this particular meal had taken on a whole tradition of its own. I want you to think about this. Everything that was done at the Passover meal had a tradition. It's a bit like Single and Tamil New Year for us. You know, on the New Year day, you don't eat french fries and burgers, do you? No, because there's a tradition about what you're supposed to eat. You don't eat pasta. No, that's traditional food. And if you, if you follow the, 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 all the rules about New Year's, there's stuff you say, stuff you do, times you do things that. There's a bunch of rules and traditions. Now, as Christians, we don't follow any of the superstitions around that event and that celebration. But there are traditional rules and, and, and there's an etiquette to that celebration at Aurudu. Similarly, similarly, the Passover meal was very much like that. Everything you said, everything you did, everything, every story you, you recited, every, every song you sang, everything had a tradition. This was the meal that Jesus was just about to take part in. So here we are in Luke chapter 7 and verse 22. Jesus takes the bread this is the place. He's running the show. He is administering this very traditional meal. And so far, everything is going according to tradition. He takes the bread, just like so many thousands of Jews had done over the centuries. And then he deviates from tradition. He says something that has never been said before. And this is what he says. Verse 19. And he, Jesus, took the bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Verse 20. And likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, This cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus was saying the whole point of Passover, all these hundreds of years, was him. Passover was pointing to him. He was the Lamb of God coming to take away sin. He was coming to be a sacrifice so that God's anger against us would pass over us. This is why 1 Corinthians 5, 8 says, Jesus Christ, our Passover Lamb, has been slain. So after centuries of celebrating Passover in this very traditional manner, Jesus breaks with the tradition and he breaks that bread and he says, do this in remembrance of me. Do this in remembrance of me. And so remembering Jesus ever since that day, we have taken part in communion up to this day. And as we get ready to take communion today, as we celebrate what Jesus did with his life, I want to lay three thoughts in front of you. Three thoughts in front of you. Whether you take communion or not, this is going to be important for you. And I don't want you to switch off just because communion is not, is not something that you take part of. Especially if you don't take part in communion, this message is going to be very valuable for all of us so that we can really see what Jesus did with his life. And the first thing I want to tell you is we're going to switch to 1 Corinthians 11 now. The first thing I want to tell you about communion and what we're studying today is this. Communion, firstly, Communion is meant to unite us. Communion is meant to unite us. Verse 17 of 1 Corinthians 11 says this, But in the following instructions, I do not commend you, because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions. That's the word there. Divisions among you. As a church, we embrace diversity. In our church family, uh, we have many different types of people. We have rich people, we have poor people, we have Burgers and Sinhalese and Tamils and Muslims and, and many other nationalities and ethnicities. We have those who support this political party. We have those who support that political party. We have people who are single, people who are married, people who are educated, people who are uneducated. And the diversity is fine because God loves a diverse family. We all come together and we are united as a family regardless of our diversity. The problem is not diversity. The problem is when our diversity causes divisions. Diversity is not a problem, but division 
is. Division occurs when we try to take those things that make us unique, those things that make us diverse, and we take those things and we start excluding people. That's when division occurs. For example, if I start saying, oh, I am English speaking, I really, I really don't want to really associate with those people who don't speak the language that I'm comfortable with. We are taking something that makes us diverse, and now we are starting to cause divisions. Or maybe we can say, Pastor, uh, some people will come and tell me, Pastor, you know, uh, I don't really fit with them. I mean, I know we are brothers and sisters in Christ, but you know, from my background, Pastor, I'm, uh, I'm Tamil, no? And so we have a culture of Pastor, so they are, that's, that's in the So, I mean, I'm, I'm okay with them, but that's, you know, I, we can never be like that close to Pastor. That's where diversity has caused division. Because what Paul is saying here is that you can't take part in communion if you are divided. If you say that you don't have meaningful relationships with people in our congregation, in our church, who are different from you, based on whatever, whatever criteria, then this passage is going to be a problem for you. If your differences have caused you to be separated from your brothers and sisters, and now there are divisions, this passage is going to be a problem for you. This is why we have a Tamil service and a Sinhala service, but we don't have a Tamil church or a Sinhala church. Because we are one body, one community with different languages and cultures. We are diverse, but not divided. This is why the idea of a, of a Tamil church or a Sinhala church is unbiblical. Now don't get me wrong, if you are watching us and you are part of a church that does ministry in one language because that's the language that is most spoken in the area that you live in or most of the people who come to church speak that language, that is completely fine. But if you are part of a church where we exclude people based on the fact that they don't speak the language that we speak, then that's wrong. Because we are meant to be diverse but not divided. Communion is meant to unite us. So this is what was meant to happen in the, in the Corinthian church at the, those days. Those days, everybody met in a home. There were 30, 40, 50 people. They would all come together, and they would have church. And then they would, they would eat together. That was their communion. And, and it, was a, it was an amazing, revolutionary place, because rich people would eat with poor people. People with status would eat with people who don't have status. The haves would eat with the have-nots. And this was revolutionary, because in, 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 in normal society, this would never happen. This would never happen. These type of people would never mix. It just didn't happen in real life. But in the church, it happened. Communion was to be a demonstration of that unity. We do this now in our church. We take communion together, and there's people who are earning 10,000 rupees a month, standing next to people who are earning millions of rupees a month. And we take communion together because in front of God, we are all equal. This was what was supposed to be happening in the, commun in the Corinthian church. But this was not happening in the Corinthian church. Because Paul says in verse 20, when you come together, he's talking about the Corinthian church, he says, it is not, not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you for this? No, I will not. But what was happening here in the Corinthian church? Instead of all of them eating together, instead of that, what was happening was the rich people were let in first. They would come, they would eat everything they wanted to, they would get fully satisfied, get the best of all the food and the drink. And after they were finished, then the poor people were let in and they were told to have the leftovers. And Paul was saying, what kind of Christian love is this? How is it that rich people get preferential treatment? Aren't we all equal in front of God? Paul says communion is meant to unite us. How would you feel if at church we suddenly decided COVID is, seems to be getting better, we're going to meet live, right? And we're going to have a big celebration meal. How would you feel if we said, okay, if you earn more than 100,000 rupees, you come at 6 o'clock and you celebrate the meal with us. If you earn less than 100,000 rupees, you come after 9 and we'll give you the leftovers. That's a bit what it was like in the Corinthian church. We would be really upset, wouldn't we? And how many people have been hurt by churches treating different people in the church differently. And Paul is saying that is not the way to go. Communion is meant to unite us. 
Not only is communion meant to unite us, I want to tell you, you can take the bread and, and the drink today, or on any day, and you can take it and still not take part in communion. You can take the bread and the drink, and even if you take it physically, you can still not take part in communion. I want to read that verse again. When you come together, verse 20 says, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat, for in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. In Corinth, the rich people took first place and that others were just afterthoughts. If you aren't considering the lives of your brothers and sisters, if the, the, what the people in our church are going through, what the people around you are going through, does not matter to you. You can also take the bread and the drink today and still not take part in communion if you're doing it out of tradition. You can take the bread and the drink today and still, still not take part in communion if you're doing it out of tradition. And I want to explain what I mean by doing it out of tradition. Verse 20 says, when you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper you eat. And this is a strange thing for Paul to say because people will be thinking, what do you mean? I'm here, I I'm have the bread, I have the drink, there's a pastor, presumably, he's saying something, uh, like his speech, he's praying, all of it. It looks like communion, but Paul is saying it can look like communion and still not be communion because you're doing it out of tradition. Because the Lord's Supper or communion is not just something we do with our hands. It's something we do with our hearts. The outward act is, a, is symbolic of an inward devotion to Jesus. When you take communion, you say, Jesus died for me. He, he took my sin. I put my sin to death and I love and worship him. But if you just take the bread and eat it and you take the drink and drink it, but you don't love Jesus, it's just an empty ritual. It's not life-giving. If you take communion and you don't love Jesus, you aren't prepared for him to have all say in all the decisions of your life. You haven't made him, as Christians say, the Lord of your life. You are doing it out of tradition. Maybe you are thinking, well, this is the spiritual thing to do. It's what good people do. Maybe you think taking part in communion will get you to heaven. I assure you, it will not. Maybe you think that even though he isn't the Lord of your life, it will bring you some blessing or some good luck. I assure you, it won't. What you are attempting to do there, if you do that, is take part in communion as a tradition. If that's you, if you are just doing it because you've always done it, if that's you, if you're doing it without actually having Jesus as the Lord of your life, without actually loving Jesus, you are not taking part in communion. You're just taking the bread and the drink out of tradition. Some of us, we grew up in Christian homes. You went to church from a young age. You went to confirmation classes or communion classes. And that's why you take part in communion. It hasn't hit your heart. I want to tell you, friend, you are taking part in communion. You are thinking you are taking part in communion, but you are not. Some of us, when we were younger, our parents insisted that we take part in communion. It was a sign of our maturity that we had grown up in Jesus. And we started taking it, and over the years, our love for Jesus has gone cold, but we still take communion. I want to tell you, you think you are taking part in communion, but you are not. You're just doing it out of tradition. Think about it. When you take part in communion, are you actually thinking about Jesus? Are you confessing your sin? Are you devoting yourself to him? Are you standing up publicly for him? This is what Christians do. This is what Christians do. And if you are not prepared to do that, Maybe you are just taking it out of tradition. Paul says that's where the Corinthian church has gone. They've gone from taking, taking communion as a life-giving event and made it into an unfeeling, meaningless ritual. I see some people at church, especially when we're having church live. Some of us, we rush in, rush into service late, sometimes half an hour late. We haven't taken time to prepare ourselves. We haven't even heard what the, the pastor said about the communion passage. Communion is over. We quickly go and we get the bread and the drink and we try to swig it in. Thinking somehow that doing that is what Christians do. Don't take communion out of tradition. You can have bread in your mouth and have no faith in your heart. You can take the bread and the drink 
and still not take part in communion. So if you want to take part in communion today, there are some requirements that the Bible lays out for us. I can think of at least two, and I want to lay those in front of you. Firstly, we have to examine ourselves. We have to examine ourselves. Verse 27 says this, Whoever therefore eats the bread and or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty concerning the body and blood of the Lord. Verse 28, Let a person therefore examine himself, then and so eat of the bread and drink of the cup. He goes on to say in verse 27, Whoever eats the bread and drinks of the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, what is an unworthy manner? Someone who, without being a Christian, or without actually living like a Christian, without repenting of sin and changing the direction of our lives, someone like that taking part in communion will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. If we do this without actually seriously looking and taking stock and reflecting about our lives, if we do this without actually wanting to change from ways that are wicked that we, that we might live in, we're actually sinning against Jesus. That's what the scripture says. We're sinning against Jesus. You might be saying, I, I just take communion because that's what Christians do. It's part of the show, so to speak. If you are saying that you want to take communion and you want to acknowledge the fact that Jesus died for you, then you and I also must be willing to say that we are going to put our sin to death. If you or I don't want to do that, if we don't want to put our sin to death, then we are making a mockery of what Jesus did on that cross. Paul says that we have to examine ourselves and see where our sin is. The point is I can't judge you all. That's not my job. You have to examine yourself. God I know knows my thoughts, my words, my deeds and my sin. And I must examine myself, myself before I partake of communion. That is why we don't rush communion. We take our time because we need to examine ourselves before we take part in communion. Firstly, we must examine ourselves. We must reflect and think about where we are. And we must then decide to take communion after we are sure that we have reflected and examined ourselves. But just as importantly, after we examine ourselves, we must decide then, decide to be faithful Christians. We must, we must decide to be followers of Jesus. Now, I know some of you must be saying, wow, Dishan, that second step was really easy. I'm already a Christian. I'm already a follower of Jesus. I can do that. But hold on. Are you really sure that you are a follower of Christ? Are you really following Jesus? We must examine ourselves, and then the Bible says we must turn. Turn. The Bible uses the word repent. Repent of our sin. We must decide to actually be faithful followers of Jesus. I want to ask you today, do you hate sin? Do you love Jesus? Do you trust Jesus? Do you worship Jesus? Have you decided to follow Jesus with all your life? Is every decision that you make under his guidance? Have you put your entire faith in Jesus? Turning from sin is not just about not being lustful or not being angry or not being deceitful. Yes, that is part of it. But turning from sin is saying all my reliance, all my reliance is on Jesus. So after we examine ourselves, we must turn towards Him. Is all our reliance on Jesus. When you turn from sin, it's not just stopping watching pornography, or stopping lying, or stopping robbing. Those things are very important. But it's not just that. When you turn towards Jesus, all your reliance is on Him. It's us saying no to the astrologers and, and their date for when we have to start a business or go on a new venture. It's us saying no to the katadias. It's us saying no to the 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 the, the faith person or the gifted person who, who seems to know stuff and we get advice from. It's not Jesus plus someone else or something else. It's only Jesus. Jesus on the night that he broke the bread and said, this is my body broken for you. Christ gave himself for us. I want you to think about this. Christ is in us and that should just turn and change the way we live. We can't have a reliance on Jesus and somebody else and say we have turned to Jesus. Jesus wants all of us. If you are seeing the astrologer, if you are getting other spiritual advice, if you've got one foot in this camp and one foot in the other, if you are dabbling with things that are not from God, please don't take communion. It is not for you. We must examine ourselves and then we must turn 
and set our eyes on Jesus and our entire reliance must be on Jesus. That is what true repentance is. Let's take some time today to really examine ourselves. Let's take a few moments to reflect on where we are. I'm going to ask for the elements to be brought uh, forward so that we can take communion together. But as they are being brought forward so that I can lead you as we partake in communion, would you maybe, wherever you are, and I know sometimes it's, it's really something strange to do this because you might be in your home or in your workplace or somewhere else. Would you just close your eyes so that you can focus on Jesus? Don't focus on the TV or the, or the computer or the phone. Don't focus on the people around you. But focus your eyes on Jesus. I want to give you some time to think about your life. To think about the decisions you are making. To ask yourself and for me to ask myself, am I really following Jesus? Is he really the Lord of my life? Are there sins in my life that I haven't confessed? Are there decisions in my life that he doesn't have final say over? Let's just take a moment to reflect. Are there things, parts of our lives that we keep private? that are not open to Him? Do we give Him Lordship over 99% of the decisions of our life, but some things we just don't? Are there certain relationships that we know are not according to His will, but, but we just still accommodate those relationships? Or we turn a blind eye to certain habits that we've always had? Jesus wants to be the Lord of all. That's it. He wants to be the Lord of all. It's Lord of all or nothing at all. And are we ready to come to the place of fully relying on Jesus before we take communion? As we take time to reflect on what Jesus did with his life, and not just with his life, but with his death and his resurrection, we come to the communion table. And Paul in 1 Corinthians 11 takes us back to Luke chapter 22, to that last night, that last meal that Jesus was happening at that Jesus was having with his disciples before the crucifixion. And this is what Paul says. I'm reading from 1 Corinthians verse 23. And Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also passed on to you. The Lord Jesus, on the night he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. Verse 26. For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. The Apostle Paul takes us back to that night when Jesus told his disciples that he was the Passover lamb, that he was the one who was being slain so that we could be forever with him in eternity so that our sins would be not counted against us as we take the bread into our hands Jesus on that night said this is my body broken for you do this in remembrance of me let's pray and then let's partake Jesus we thank you God that your body was broken for us that you suffered and died so that we could be set free. We thank you for your sacrifice. Let's partake. On that same night, Jesus took the cup and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood this cup is a symbol a symbol of his blood being shed for us the same type of symbol it was in Egypt all those thousands of years before when the blood of the lamb was on the doorpost and for thousands of years since then people have celebrated God's judgment passing over them because of the blood of the lamb we now celebrate the lamb who was slain for the sins of the world. I celebrate the fact that today, as I drink this cup, 
that I am free from sin because of his shed blood. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you for the blood that was slain. It is so precious because it took away the sin of the world. I thank you, God, that my works aren't counted against me, but that your grace, your grace that was bought with your blood, covers my sin. I thank you for that. Let's partake. Just before we move on to the next part of the service, I want to pray for you and I want to bless you as we close this part of the service. And I want to remind you, if you are watching from wherever you're watching and you have never taken part in communion, don't worry about it. Communion doesn't save us. Communion doesn't get us to heaven. Traditions and things we do, do not. The shed blood of Jesus is what offers us salvation. The fact that he paid the price for us and therefore his, his sacrifice sets us free. God's wrath and his anger passes over us and we enjoy his grace. And today, if you have never, never had the opportunity to really ask this Jesus to be the Lord of your life, and by Lord of your life, it's this Christian language for saying Jesus being the one who has the final say in the decisions over your life. If you've never had the opportunity to do that, if you've never had the opportunity to say, Jesus, I turn, I repent from my sins and I want to have a new life with you. I want to give you that opportunity. The Bible says that there's not just the last supper which Jesus had. There's also another meal in the Bible, in Revelation, called the marriage supper of the Lamb. The Lamb who was slain, Jesus, one day will have a huge feast with us in heaven. And that's something that we as believers in Jesus Christ, people who follow Jesus, have something, it's something that we can hope for. And I want to give you an opportunity together with us to hope for that, to have this hope that Jesus and his grace has set you free. Would you pray with me? Jesus, we thank you that your sacrifice has set us free. And I just pray, God, that if there is anyone here who wants to put their faith and trust in you, I just pray, Lord, that right now you would show yourself and reveal yourself to them. God, your word says that if we turn from our sins, if we repent, that you will accept us and that your grace will cover us. And so we turn from our sins and we repent and we say, Jesus, come and be the Lord of our lives. Lord, we look forward to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Lord, that one day in heaven, in eternity, we will be together enjoying your goodness and enjoying you. And that is our hope. I pray for every family represented at this service. Lord, everyone who's watching us, whether today or on a different day, or whether it's on their phone or their computer or their, or their TV, God, all of them are precious to you. And I pray blessing on each family. Lord, that, that as we look to follow you with all our heart, as we look to live faithfully to the scriptures and the word of God, I just pray, God, uh, that you will show yourself in new ways to us. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Nishan, for that encouraging word and that challenging message that has come to us so clearly. May the Lord bless those words to everybody who's with us on this service today. Right now, we would like to bring you a video clip that has been put together by the Relief Ministry team of People's Church. Just watch this. Dear People's Church family and all of you who stood with us, few months back, we appealed to you to respond to what our nation was going through as a result of the pandemic the floods, and even the economic crisis. You, yes, you responded, and God has used you in ways you cannot even imagine. Well, here is a small update, how we as a church were able to show the tangible love of God because you gave. We provided over 224,000 cooked meals to over 50 locations within 15 districts of Sri Lanka. We were also able to provide over 4,000 dry ration packs to over 35 locations within 13 districts. 
Our goal was to provide 1000 medical packs to quarantine families with some basic vitamins needed to boost immunity and help those who could not immediately access a hospital. Well, we were able to do a total of 2100 medical packs to bless people and help, help them during this difficult time. We were able to go beyond what we had planned in the past two months. We even provided 10 ICU beds to five hospitals. In addition to this, you know, we were able to look into the educational needs of 62 families and provide devices and tabs for children who had no means of connecting to the online schooling system. In addition to all of this, we at People's Church were able to start Lanka Lifeline as a means of providing crisis support and counseling for people who are going through difficult times and trying times so they can find healing and hope. We say all of this to show you that in 2021, you saw the need and you did not hesitate to be a part of all that God is doing in reaching those who need help the most. Thank you. Thank you for standing with us, for giving of your time and supporting us financially. Without the People's Church Families Partnership, prayer and support, we would not be able to make an impact like we have made today. You know, we know that God is not done. And through the seeds planted, there will be more open doors and opportunities to stand in the gap and see lives change to the tangible love of Christ. So thank you and may God bless you all. I know that you would have been inspired by that video clip that you just watched brought to you by the Relief Ministry team of People's Church. So before we close our service for today, let me bring you the announcements and I want you to pay attention to all these announcements. First of all, on Tuesday, we have lived the life at 7 p.m. on Zoom. And this will be our final Live the Life program for 2021. So make sure that you don't miss it and you join us on Tuesday at 7 p.m. on Zoom. Wednesday is our family all today and I would encourage you to join with your family right there in your home, discuss the scriptures together, discuss it with your children and your family members and pray together so that you could have a beautiful family altar in your own home as well. If you need to access the scriptures, please go to the People's Church app and you will find the scriptures there. And of course on Friday, we have the Hour of Hope prayer time at 7 o'clock once again in the evening on Zoom. If you need prayer or you know somebody who needs prayer, please bring them along and join the Hour of Hope on Friday at 7 p.m. So that's it for today on our People's Church service. I believe that you were encouraged, you received new hope and you were restored in your faith. Thank you for joining us once again. And even as we hear about all these variants, we have prayed, but please take all the precautions that need to be taken and be safe in the presence of Jesus Christ, our blessed Lord and Savior. Have a beautiful week through Christ our Lord. God bless you.